The following program is brought to you by Caltech. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you all for coming to this special lecture as part of uh, a KISS workshop being held here at Caltech on Venus seismology. <clears throat> so it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you Philippe Lonnernier. Uh, Philippe is uh, perhaps the uh, only person in the world who really has emphasized in his career planetary seismology, that is seismology on bodies other than the Earth. Uh, that's not to say that he hasn't also uh, thought about the Earth, but, but he is uniquely qualified to talk about the topic that he will address today. Philippe uh, is uh, from the Institut de Physique du Globe in Paris and a professor at the University of Paris there. Uh, he has a long-standing connection to Caltech. In fact, uh, he was a visiting professor across the road in the office next to me at one point. Um, uh, he has also spent time, I think, at Berkeley, right? Uh, and I'm sure numerous other places. And um, he is going to talk about new frontiers of planetary seismology. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming Philippe. So uh, first, it's a big pleasure for me to, to remember that uh, maybe 20 years ago, I made a seminar just on the opposite street of the, on the opposite side of the street. Uh, this seminar was uh, a few years before the launch of Mars 96, and it was one year before the impact of the comet Shoemaker Levy 9 on Jupiter. And uh, I was young at that time, and I, the title of the seminar was more or less in two years we get seismic data of Mars and we get seismic data of Jupiter. Uh, as you know, the the impact of the shoemaker Levy 9 comet was not strong enough, and the impact of Mars 96 on the Earth's atmosphere, or more, on the Earth's ocean, was too large. <laughs> so, and uh, okay, Bruce is here. I, I, I don't want to, to, to have him uh, spending a bad night, you know, so to, to, uh, and to, to have the feeling that he took really the wrong guy. Yes. Okay, so uh, I will try to, to do with you, uh, so I, I have one hour to do uh, one, two, three, four planets, so uh, I will not go in the detail of seismology for all the planets. I am very sorry for that. Uh, but uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, journey we will do together to the frontier of planetary seismology will be mainly uh, uh, to go to the interior of the terrestrial planet. There is a lot of stuff to, to say on uh, Jupiter. 20 years ago, also some people in France, you know, Benoit Moser, they tried to get the, but also uh, people, uh, uh, the scientists in the state, they tried to get uh, the free oscillation of uh, Jupiter. Uh, it is still not completely done, but we start to have also uh, the first indication of uh, something uh, oscillating on the giant planet. We also may discuss and talk on the seismology on asteroid, but I will just, and also of course of the sun, uh, but I will just focus on these uh, four bodies. Sometime I will say that the moon is a planet, so please excuse me if it is not completely true, but um, I will work on these four bodies. Also, a very important point is that most of this work is uh, resulting from many collaboration with uh, colleagues, with collaborators, with friends. Uh, here is the list. 
uh, and also it is uh, resulting from uh, the support from uh, the French Space Agency and CNRS. You know they they have put a lot of effort in uh, you know uh, giving us the support during uh, many many years to 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 address uh, seismology on Mars and also ionospheric seismology and also the Office of Naval Research. Uh, you know, which is uh, funding us also on Earth topic and the French INR. Okay, I will first start with the, the first success story. So Bruce is here. Uh, he made a 800 page proposal for uh, what we believe to be the next success story. But uh, this first success story was very short, you know. Uh, okay, it will be the second success story for the proposal, but the first success story, as you know, is just the, uh, the Earth. So it started something like uh, more than one century ago, the first quake. Okay. And then uh, something like uh, 10 years after we got the seismology theory with a P wave, S wave, Rayleigh wave, and then uh, we got the crust. We got the core with Oldham in 1906. So now you see uh, 1906, so we are in, uh, it is uh, 108 years ago. And finally, we got the inner core in 36. And uh, of course, after that, uh, stuff started to be more and more uh, precise. And everywhere, you know, in my talk, uh, we will discuss on propagation of seismic wave in the interior of the body. I will not go to the detail, but uh, as you know, this wave gives us information about the interior structure. It gives us information about the P wave, the S wave. And the next success story uh, for the Earth were started in uh, the 80s uh, with the first tomographic model of the Earth uh, going down to the inner core. The outer core is completely uh, desesperate for seismology because it is almost completely uh, homogene. I don't think that I would say it will be difficult. It will be very difficult for seismology to get the lateral variation of the outer core. But now today, of course, we know better and better this, and we have uh, thousand, ten thousand of stations everywhere except in uh, this uh, oceanic part of the, of the Earth. So the second success story, here we go to the proposal aspect. So Bruce, I guess it was 800 page for uh, insight. So this mission or this project was one page uh, and uh, seismology was not driving at all the project. This was a, the Apollo project, you know, five very simple questions uh, signed by uh, uh, the President Kennedy in 1961. Uh, the first one is not a science question, but it is a very simple one. Do we have a chance to beat of beating the Soviet, etc., etc.? And the very good thing for seismology is that uh, seismology was piggyback in the project almost at the starting point. Uh, seismology was there. And uh, it was there. And and also, it was also here at Caltech and at GPL because the first seismometer integrated uh, in the story of uh, planetary exploration was integrated at GPL. Uh, this seismometer was located in this uh, sphere, which was a big uh, balsa wood sphere uh, used to protect the seismometer at the time of the impact. This sphere was ejected just before the crash of the Ranger uh, uh, spacecraft. Three spacecraft were launched in 62, 62, 62. So three missions in the same time. And you know this was the time when uh, the technical problem of, the, of a mission was not possible to fix on the mission. So you had to to wait the, the other one in, in order to fix, because it was going so fast that uh, no time was given to solve the problem. And also it was the time when uh, it was requested by GPL and NASA 
to provide a complete sterile seismometer. And here you have the, the uh, people are working on the seismometer, making the integration of the seismometer in this big chamber, completely sterile. I understand that uh, GPL requested a change request, a waiver uh, for this uh, process. And I am quite happy that uh, we will not have to do exactly the same, even if our seismometer will be clean. So, uh, but uh, after that, you know, the story continue here. You have the Apollo 14 crew uh, training for the deployment of the seismometer of uh, Apollo, and the seismometer is located there. So, it was a double success. I will not go into the detail for uh, the success related to the, the race uh, to the moon. Uh, here you got the launch. Here, this is a picture uh, which is taken, by the way, uh, two weeks before in Baikonur. And it's very interesting to know that uh, a seismometer was also planned on the Soviet uh, mission. It was, uh, it was uh, an inclinometer in quartz, a quartz fuse inclinometer, very sensitive, which was put in liquid. And, uh, but also on the Russian side, they had uh, uh, the idea to have uh, seismic data recorded by their mission. You know that their mission never ended up because uh, this rocket, you know, had a major tr trouble and were not able to be used for the, the moon. Okay, so now we are on the moon. And uh, this is a picture taken by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And uh, I forget to say that everything you will see in terms of data uh, in seismology, planetary seismology is uh, because of NASA. And so everywhere I may have to put NASA, NASA, NASA. So I did, did not put everywhere, but everything here is uh, just from NASA mission. So here you have uh, the, an object at the surface. This object is there, you know, if you, if you get uh, a better picture, and you see three, uh, you see three, uh, you know, three spots here, three white spots. And in fact, if you take a picture on the ground, you will recognize the three white spots. The first one is a flag. Second one is a seismometer. Third one is a laser reflector. And uh, the last part is, of course, the lab. And therefore, seismic data were already uh, taken on the moon in uh, 69. And this started uh, the Apollo discoveries for seismology. So, Four seismometers were deployed. Uh, the first one on, in fact, five seismometers were deployed. The first one was on Apollo 11, but this one was not able to, to survive more than one and a half day. It survived the night, but it was not able to survive the day, uh, mainly because the power system was not ready at that time for this mission. So it was a solar panel powered uh, instrument. And for Apollo 12, Apollo 13, Apollo 14, Apollo 15, Apollo 16, uh, seismometers were in the mission. You know, the seismometers were put in this uh, thermal protection, and the seismometer is um, inside the thermal protection. And here you have a picture of the instrument where you, you have the instrument, the, the, the cable, uh, going to the uh, power system there. Uh, for seismologists and for all the engineers working on, on inside, this instrument is really a terrible challenge. This is a technology of the 70s, uh, and uh, it is very, very difficult today to do something better for very simple reasons. Everything was done in beryllium, so it is just impossible to do something in beryllium anymore. You add a big RTG just for the seismometer, mainly. And uh, you add a control, temperature control to less than a fraction of degrees. So it was perfect. 
may be a little bit expensive. So, what the mission was able to, to discover was a, a lot of quake. Of course, you are in California to, 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 to have more than a few quakes per day is something, you know, quite... Uh... Okay, sorry. Okay, so, so the different quakes which were recorded by the mission were, were the following. The first are quite obvious, these are the meteorite impact, you know, impact uh, there. Uh, and uh, here you see an example of wave uh, uh, done by a colleague from uh, Utah University uh, on the propagation of this wave. Uh, you have both natural and artificial impact uh, and I will go to the artificial impact in a few minutes. Then the second type of quake were uh, the shallow moon quake. Shallow mean on the moon something between 50 up to, okay, some of the shallow moon quake are very shallow, but in fact we have a big error in the determination of the depths, but more or less the shallow moon quake are up to depths of the order of 200 kilometers with an error bar of the order of 25 kilometers. And then you have the deep moon quake. Uh, deep moon quake between depths of 750 up to 1200 kilometers, which were very, very non-typical with respect to Earth standard and very useful as you will see uh, very soon. So in terms of quake activity, uh, there are a lot of astronomers, I guess, in this building who want to put a telescope on the moon, maybe, because the moon is very stable. It is true the moon is very stable, but it is also true that the moon is very active in terms of uh, number of quakes per day. Here you have uh, the typical activity uh, on one station, Apollo 14. This is the number of quakes per year. So this is 10 to the power three, so 1,000 quake per year, 100 quake per year, 10 quake per year. And you see that uh, this deep moon quake here, uh, you know, you get something like uh, almost 1,000 deep moon quake per year detected by a single station. So uh, several per day. You get uh, a lot of impact uh, too, you know, more than 100 impact uh, per year. The number of impacts detected by the lunar network is almost 1,800 over the seven years of operation of the network. And then you have the shallow moon quake. The shallow moon quake, you see, you don't have so much. Only less than 30 shallow moon quakes were recorded over the seven years. A lot of this quake and very few of this one. And this shallow moon quake are those which are probably the most comparable to the earthquake. So why do we get so much quake? Because I did not discuss this uh, part of the figure where you have the amplitude. Maybe at the back of the room you don't see the amplitude, but to give you the number, this is 10 minus 10 meter per second. So this is one angstrom per second in terms of ground velocity. So very, very small velocity. And what you see on this record, for example, you see this change in the value of the seismogram. This is the number of uh, digital units of the seismometer. So which means that this here is one nanometer of displacement. And therefore, this quake is typically two or three nanometer in ground displacement. <coughs> so these were very, very, very small quake. And the beautiful point of the Apollo seismometer is that no noise was recorded by the seismometer when no quake was detected. So the noise of the instrument was below uh, the, the detection limit of the instrument. So now I go to modern seismology because you can, you can imagine, okay, so it's nice. It was done in the 70s. Everything is published. And uh, so what else to do? So. We 
we are very lucky in the community uh, because of a very unlucky uh, event. Uh, uh, and this was the Lunar A uh, project uh, decided by Japan. So Lunar A was, start, was decided in the late 90s, in the early 90s. Uh, and uh, by in the late 90s, uh, JAXA, the Japanese space agency, decided to take all the Apollo seismic data and to transfer this seismic data in exobyte. Uh, and then today we have all this seismic data on the net. And therefore, you know, this was a huge work done by Japan, uh, provided to the community. And today, all this data, you know, you can just get them uh, through internet, like the, the, the seismic data of any station of the Earth. And this made a big change in the research, because a lot of scientists started to, to work on this data. And uh, you can even imagine something, you know, very surprising is that it was even possible to find data which were never published in seismology. So data staying in some place, you know. So this, this place was, uh, you know, the Yost, uh, Austin University, but I guess the, the picture is not in Yost, Austin. And this were the, the data uh, from the, the lunar gravimeter. So the lunar gravimeter was supposed to detect the gravity wave. You know, it was a precursor of LISA, Virgo, whatever you can imagine. Uh, and the idea was to use the, the moon as a big resonator. So you put a gravimeter on the moon, and when you have a gravity wave from uh, the collapse of a star, you know, passing through the, the moon, you, you start to, to have uh, the moon ringing. And it turned out that this gravimeter was not well done, and it was not able okay, to work on the moon in a proper way. And uh, because of the astronauts, you know, the astronauts were able to open it and to fix it a little bit. And uh, at the end, it, it was uh, working again, but not in a good way for uh, detecting this uh, gravity wave. And therefore, the PI was an astrophysicist, you know, was not interested anymore in this instrument. And uh, all the data were sent back to Earth and stay somewhere. A few uh, years ago, five years ago, a student from uh, uh, ISAS, so uh, Taishi Kawamura, went to, uh, uh, to Texas to, to see if this data were existing, you know, and he found this type of data. And you see, indeed, this is, again, the number of uh, least significant bits, the resolution of the instrument. If you remember the figure I've shown you for the seismometer, you had one bit of noise. Here, you have 10 bits of noise. So this is a huge noise. But just if you filter this data, this is what you get. In fact, when you filter the noise, you are able to get back uh, with a seismic signal, which means that we just five years ago discovered a new seismic station on the moon. So Apollo 17 located there. Of course, not so good compared to the other one, but still good enough to do some science. So what are the, the result of all these efforts? Uh, I will not go in everything, so maybe it will, I will need a, another seminar just to address <laughs> the point uh, and the, the discoveries done in the last 10 years in, uh, in moon seismology. So the first thing we did in IPGP and uh, another team uh, uh, led by Amir Khan uh, uh, in Denmark uh, did also the same work, was to, to go back to the crustal thickness of the moon. And uh, if you take the paper published by the end of the Apollo uh, project uh, in 1980, so at that time you will see that all the paper claims that uh, the crust is 60 kilometers. And when we started to work on that, we, we found big issues. In fact, because we were never able to go back to this 60 kilometer crustal thickness. So in IPGP, we found a crustal thickness between 30 and uh, 40 kilometers. 
uh, Han found crustal thickness from 38 to 45. But you see it is almost twice the, the crustal thickness of the 80s. So this is something strange. So I would say you can do uh, the same. OK, it's not good for seismology if I say that. But you, you take the same data, you do the, the analysis, and you end up with a very different value for the crystal thickness. And one of the reasons is very simple, is that seismology, in fact, is uh, no more recording than uh, travel time. In fact, you don't get the velocity. You get the arrival time of the wave. And here you have uh, two uh, examples of data processing. This was done uh, with the left phoenix. Uh, uh, and uh, the idea is uh, to do what we call in earth seismology a receiver function. So you stack all the conversion of a seismic wave at the bottom of the crust in order to get the crustal thickness, uh, to get the crustal thickness. And this is something you get through the detection of the conversion of the wave at this uh, discontinuity. And this is uh, the arrival time of the primary wave. And here you see there is a signal before, a precursor wave, which is related to the conversion of a S wave into a P wave. And because the P wave is traveling faster than the S wave, it is arriving before the S wave. And here you have the data. OK, of course, with some noise. And here you have two synthetics, the first one with 30 kilometer and the second one with 60 kilometer crust. The only thing we change are the values of the velocity. So we keep the same travel time uh, between the two models. Uh, so therefore, when we increase the crustal thickness, we also increase the velocity here. And we when we decrease the crustal thickness, we decrease the velocity in such a way that the travel time is the same. And this is what uh, was basically found, is that uh, the first model found by, by the Apollo were not able to, to go through all the, uh, the, the space of the model and were not able to, to detect, I would say, uh, this uh, other part. And it turned out that uh, this is something we were able to confirm with other type of data. And uh, then the idea was to use the lunar impact, and especially the artificial lunar impact. Because for the lunar impact, you, you know the time. So you, you, you see in this problem here, you don't, you don't know the time of the source. You just get the travel time. But for the impact, you know the time of the impact. Because on the, the spacecraft, uh, the spacecraft was able to send a beacon. And when the beacon disappeared, it means that the spacecraft disappear. So it is just the impact time. At that time, the moon was not protected, and anything going to the moon was free to impact the moon without any uh, planetary protection. And therefore, very big stuff were impacting the moon. So this was the Saturn 4B upper stage, 15 ton at uh, 2.5 kilometers per second. And here you get the impact. Uh, recorded by LRO. Uh, and uh, here you get the seismic data of this impact recorded by uh, all the stations. This was uh, the Apollo 17, so one of the last of the story. And therefore, you get a lot of data up to 1,000 kilometers away uh, because of the size of the impact. So this gave us very good profile with very good timing. And uh, we did that also for artificial impact, uh, for natural impact. So this is a, a much larger impact, you know, almost on the, on the far side compared to the Apollo network. And here you get signal up to 3,500 kilometers with very large signal to noise ratio. Of course, the natural impact, you know, are not known in terms of position and in terms of uh, timing. Even if you will see uh, maybe in the future, if we go back to the moon, we might be able to do that. And the, the, the result of this was to, to get, again, estimation of the crustal thickness uh, here, which were completely confirming the fact that the mean crustal thickness is something like 38 kilometer, maybe 40 kilometer, but 
definitively not the 60 kilometer we thought uh, in the 80s. And what is very interesting is that in some way, this trade-off between very low velocity in the upper crust and high velocity in the upper crust was confirmed by Grail because the main result of Grail is that they found a very, very high porosity uh, of the moon in the upper layer, which is completely coherent with uh, what we found uh, in the analysis of the seismic data. And again, I would say Grail is confirming this crustal thickness with the mean crustal thickness, again, bet between 35 and 45 kilometer. Grail is not able to, to, to tell us more than this for the average crustal thickness. But uh, what we know is that this is completely uh, OK with uh, the analysis of the seismic data. Another stuff uh, which was very interesting and on which a lot of work is still uh, uh, ongoing is to understand the, the impact processes. Uh, here you have, uh, you, we, we found that uh, the impact has a very low, relatively low cutoff frequency. Here you see you have the energy, this is 10 seconds, this is 10 hertz, and you have a cutoff frequency at about one hertz. Uh, between one and two hertz. In this example, I guess it is uh, two hertz. And here you have, uh, for all a series of natural impacts, this uh, cutoff time. So this is one second. So this is uh, 0 0.3, so it is uh, three seconds. This is uh, three hertz. And here you have the seismic moment of the impact. And what we found is that this impact are very low uh, regarding to the Earth's equivalent. So this is one of the impact. And this is just to show you a comparison. It is the, the typical uh, cutoff frequency of a one kiloton uh, explosion. I forget to say that this uh, impact, like the, uh, the Saturn IV B impact, is about 0 0.1 kiloton in terms of uh, uh, equivalent. So, now the core. Uh, the core is also interesting because in some ways seismology was late. Uh, by the end of, uh, until 2010, the view we had on the core of the moon uh, was this one. We, we saw nothing. So we, we had a lot of rays uh, in the upper mantle, in the lower mantle, but none of the ray was able to go really through the core. Not, none of the direct way, ray were able to go in the direct core. Here you have the P rays, and here you have the S uh, rays. But this figure is maybe uh, misleading in the sense that it gives you the feeling that every, all the rays are coming from the same point, which is not true because this is just a way to, to give you the, the, the resolution in depth of the seismic data. And uh, uh, many indications from uh, a conductive core were uh, given by uh, the analysis of the uh, lunar prospector data uh, by Hood and colleagues. And also uh, other indications were uh, coming from uh, the liberation uh, by the GPL team uh, uh, led by William and uh, the GPL colleague. So all these indications were suggesting that something conductive, something liquid was inside the moon. And uh, this was therefore uh, uh, a new idea and two groups, so one led by Rafael Garcia and the other by uh, René Weber, decided to go back to the deep moon quake data in order to search for the reflected phase they use uh, the deep moon quake, especially the very strong one like A1. You know, A1 is there compared to the lunar network. And uh, you see it is just beneath, in fact, uh, these two stations. And it gives you a very nice way to uh, send wave to the core. And then this wave will bounce and will go back to the surface. 
So in order to do that, what you need is you need to stack all the deep moon quake. You know, uh, again, I forget to say that these deep moon quakes, they occur at a rate of a few uh, per day, some, some time, uh, but they are all coming from the same fault. So this is a fault, you know, where you have quake probably since two or three billion years, all the way at the same time, and almost predictable. So this is the perfect place to predict earthquake, but it might be the only place in the solar system where seismologists will be successful. Anyway, the idea was to use that uh, two papers were published. Uh, again, the idea is to use the direct wave to get the signature of the direct wave and to cross-correlate uh, uh, with the, 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 the seismic data in order to, to get the energy coherent with this uh, direct wave. The energy is uh, plot in the red color here. Here you have uh, the radius of the core. This is the one sigma layer, the two sigma layers. These are the work from uh, Rafael Garcia. And what you see here is you see that uh, there is a peak of energy uh, which appear at a radius of the order of 350 kilometers. So, and again, it was a demonstration by seismology that uh, uh, the core was reflecting, the core was there, and it was liquid. So, what is the feeling today? The feeling is that uh, uh, you have uh, this model. So René Weber was able to, to also detect uh, inner core. Uh, there is not a full consensus on this, but uh, we have a full consensus on the fact that there is a discontinuity at the uh, top uh, related to the, dis to the transition between the liquid core and the, upper mon uh, the, uh, and the mantle. Whether or not there is an inner core, we can probably say that it is uh, not really in the noise of the data. In, in the data, we see peak of arrival coming from this uh, reflector, but the signal to noise is not very large. On the other hand, there is very, we have a lot of good reason from uh, geochemistry to believe that there is an inner core. So I will say that uh, if geochemistry was not there to, to push for the idea of an inner core, it will be likely uh, a little bit uh, difficult to claim that there is an inner core from seismology. But on the other hand, we know that we must have likely an inner core, and we see reflection from these depths. What is the composition of this inner core? So seismology can give us also some idea. Uh, through, uh, again, the inversion of the density of the velocity in the mantle. So seismology can give us some idea on the temperature when we use mineralogy. And with that, at the end, we end up with the fact that the, the estimation of the temperature is such that likely this core is uh, iron with uh, sulfur, and it might not be a pure iron core. I will stop here for the moon. You know, this is uh, our view of the moon today. And uh, this might be the future. Uh, the future might be uh, to go back at some time. If we go back, we will have the way to get all the impact, the natural impact with telescope on the Earth. You see, every time there is an impact or hitting the moon, it generates a flash. So this is something which was missing for Apollo. The next time we will have thousands of uh, natural impact like that, maybe 100 natural impact. And of course, the core signal you see here, uh, this is an estimation of the core signal. Only a stack was able to be done uh, to get the core phase, uh, the blue phase here, uh, which are below the noise of the Apollo seismometer there. But if we go with a better seismometer, we'll be able to get this core phase. So now I will stop for the moon and, and uh, I go to, to Mars, where we are not yet able to do that, but we hope to do that soon. So again, it is a very old story, uh, a long effort of the community, uh, and Bruce made a big effort in the state uh, to get something done in seismology. We started with beautiful ideas, 16, okay, Mars, 
measure was 16 station and and uh, in, in Europe, we had a lot to sell uh, Marsnet because it wa Marsnet was only supposed to be the station 17, 18, 19, and 20. So, but uh, anyway, none of this uh, was uh, possible until uh, the selection of Insight. Nevertheless, two uh, attempts were done, Viking and uh, uh, the point of Viking is that Viking landed on Mars, but the seismometer did not land on Mars. It stayed on the lander, and uh, he was able to detect mainly the noise of the lander in the wind. Uh, and uh, Mars 96, uh, and uh, the seismometer uh, provided by IPGP was in this uh, small station, but uh, Mars 96 was not able to, to go to Mars through, due to failure in the during the launch, no, after the launch, during the, uh, the insertion to Mars. So, uh, Insight was selected, uh, uh, in fact, uh, two years ago, no, in selected for phase, uh, okay, it is going so fast that uh, it was selected for step two uh, last uh, year, I guess, no, no, okay. Uh, well, yeah, one, one, okay, I have the feeling that it is so old, but uh, it, is, it is not so old. And the big problem is this one. So it will be launched in one year or nine months. So, so therefore, we, 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 we have to hurry up in order to provide uh, to GPL the flight unit. Uh, the payload is there. So the payload will be uh, mainly a seismometer plus uh, a heat flow probe plus a geodesy sensor. So you retrieve uh, you know, most of the payload on Apollo, of Apollo. So on Apollo, we had seismometer, we had Geodesy with a laser reflector. We had uh, later uh, heat flow uh, measurement. We had no weather station, but we had the solar wind measurement. And uh, on Apollo, we had an astronaut. And on inside, we have a robotic arm. And why this? Because the main uh, challenge for inside will be to do that. You have to grapple the instrument. So, and uh, it is not easy to take an instrument on a planet. And after that, you have to deploy it. Okay, so, okay, a few minutes. And then you will see issues related to the cable. Okay, so. Okay, so first cable. first cable, and we go to inside. So inside, we'll try to do the same, and we will take the instrument. When I say we, GPL, the GPL operator will take the instrument. By the way, this movie will probably be uh, six weeks long. Uh, we will put the instrument on the ground. We will then release uh, uh, the tether box very soon. We would like to have the cable like this. But then we will take uh, the windshield on the, still on the lander and we will put that windshield on the seismometer. So, this is a big challenge for the installation of the instrument. And uh, again, as you see, it is more or less exactly the same scenario as the one done by the Apollo astronaut. So here we go to, to this, uh, mainly to the seismic instrument. And uh, this is what we get on the deck, and this is what we get on the surface after deployment. So this instrument is uh, resulting from a very uh, large collaboration between uh, GPL, uh, Switzerland, Germany providing the leveling system, and uh, France are providing both the very broadband seismometer and making the integration of the instrument 
and providing also other uh, hardware uh, protecting the instrument during the launch and the cruise. And it will be more or less what you can uh, imagine uh, in the best way to do seismology on Mars. There is a lot of detail uh, because we have to take care of all this detail making noise. So we will have, uh, for example, uh, a sun dial here providing us the azimuth uh, of the sensor. On the moon, it was just the astrono astronaut, you know, looking to the Earth to get the azimuth. But here we will have another way to do that. And the big issue for us is that we are in a very, very bad uh, location in terms of uh, seismic noise. We have large temperature variation, large wind. Uh, we have dust devil. We have uh, uh, dust. Uh, etc., cetera, et cetera. And of course, because we are seismologists, we would like to be there in a big seismic vault. But this is not yet possible. So what will be the challenge? Therefore, the first challenge will be to have a good installation. There are two ways to see that. The first way is the moon one. You know, the, 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 the curve, the, the red one and the blue one are the requirement for the short period seismometer, the red one. And the long period seismometer, the blue one, I am sorry, this curve is in frequency and this one is in period. So therefore, it is the opposite. So this is the moon. And what you see is that the requirement of the instrument are well above, uh, well uh, above uh, the, the noise floor of the Apollo. So it might be easy for on the moon. But this is the Earth. And here you see that the requirements are well below the Earth's seismic noise. And this is the Earth on seismic vault. And this is a big challenge, how to go there. The first point is that we believe that this big noise here is not an issue because these are the micro-seismic peaks related to the, mainly to the oceanic uh, noise. So we don't think that this will be there unless it is a big surprise. And uh, here we have uh, mainly thermal aspect. This is a big problem. And on this side, there is a lot of noise related to cultural noise and a little bit of weather noise. So therefore, the big thing and the big effort is to, to have this seismometer very well protected. Uh, the seismometer will be located in a vacuum chamber. You know, the vacuum chamber will be protected by the thermal shield. The thermal shield will be protected by your wind protection. And the wind protection will have a ceiling skirt here with a chain mail in order to, to be sure that no wind will go through uh, the, the skirt. And of course, we have a very uh, a good uh, uh, design of uh, the cable in order to be sure that this cable will not generate stresses on the instrument. And uh, at the end, uh, we believe that we will have quite good, excellent uh, performances, uh, order of magnitude better than Viking, so between 2 to the power 3 up to two, almost 2 to the power 5 better than the Viking performances in terms of detection of quake. So with this, we hope to do all the following. So we hope to detect quake. We hope to detect the weather, seismic wave. We hope to detect the Phobos tide. We hope to detect impact. And maybe if we are lucky, in addition of the thermoelastic uh, quake generated by the thermoelastic cooling of the lithosphere, we might detect any quake related to existing tectonic activity of Mars, even if this is not something on which we can count before the detection of the first quake, of course. So let us first with the impact. So the impact is really the, the very, very cool stuff uh, for the crust as it was on the moon. And here is one example. So it's a Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter data from uh, June 2008. So here you have the same data in August. So you see that something appear. And this is an impactor at the surface. We have one seismometer, one station, so when we know the location of the source, we get the distance. When we get the distance, we can get the differential travel time, and we can just use our data to get the interior structure. 
So this is a very important point. This is another one, you know, very large, something we can do the estimation. It is about five tons at 10 kilometers per second. This is about the same impact as the, the Saturn 17 or I, shown, I have shown before. And with this, you know, we were able to, to detect uh, or to, to model the number of impact with uh, Monte Carlo techniques using the, the probabilities of impact, the, the direction of the impactor, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end, this is the limit of uh, detection. And all these guys, you know, above the red curve will likely be detected. We hope to have something like between 10 to 10 events per year, so possibly 20 events over the mission lifetime. Second point will be uh, the atmosphere. Atmosphere is a noise, but it will be for us a very interesting also source of seismic wave. So we will have a wave generated by the turbulences of the planetary boundary layer bouncing in the regolith like that. And uh, it's turned out that uh, this wave, of course, are somehow a problem. And this is why we, okay, this is why we'll, we'll have uh, a suite of uh, atmospheric pressure sensor, wind sensor. We also plan to have a magnetometer to, to get all the environment. But we do think that we will have some uh, breathing effect on the, on the planet. And these are the simulations. Okay. These are the typical simulation we, we have done for uh, the noise. So you see, we, we believe that the noise will increase during the day and will decrease during the night. And part of this noise will be corrected by the pressure sensor. But when we will do this correction, we will also be able to get information about the subsurface because the response is related to the subsurface. And uh, one example is uh, to go to a very old techniques, you know, which is a little bit not used anymore because of the receiver function, but which is just uh, related to the ratio between the horizontal to vertical seismic component. This was done on the moon. We plan to do that also uh, on Mars, and we are already doing that uh, uh, with Sharon Kedar on the Earth uh, to demonstrate that uh, it will give us uh, the subsurface structure. So, and then we have the quake. So we, we target more or less three types of quake. The big one, okay, the big one, we might have a few quake larger than 5.5, maybe one of the order of six. And when you do the, the modeling of this, you end up with the fact that we will be able to get the normal mode of uh, the planet down to about five millihertz. Okay, we will not see zero S2, the very long period normal mode, but we will get these high frequency normal modes of the planet. Uh, and uh, you may question why I go here up to 20 when it is quite difficult to get normal mode above uh, 10 millihertz on the Earth just because the planet is two times smaller. So therefore you get all the normal mode uh, of the Earth up to 20 millihertz on Mars, while on the Earth it will be at 100 seconds. And the second type of quake will be quake not strong enough to get good normal mode, but large enough to get R3. The R3 is a wave uh, turning a full turn on the planet. And this wave, you know, uh, will be detected the first time uh, uh, when uh, it is the R1. Then it will turn around reach the seismometer a second time. And that time, again, we know the distance. The distance between this wave and this wave is just the circumference of the planet. And therefore, you know the distance, you measure the time, you take the distance, you divide it by the time, and you get what you want. And the key point here is that because Mars is smaller than the Earth, and we say we will have this wave turning around the planet with about one order of magnitude amplitude larger than on the Earth. So we did everything, of course, and we end up with, uh, with the fact that we will be able to get the interior structure of Mars with this mission. And uh, 
we just now have to deliver everything on time and to be ready for the launch and for the successful landing. I speed up and I finish with the last challenge, okay, uh, Venus. I will not be very long on that because there is no data and this is the topic of the workshop. But I will just give a few ideas on what we have done on the Earth. So we did that, but <laughs> Venus is like this. So there is a big atmosphere. And the first thing to do to, in order to do seismology is to go through the atmosphere to land or not or to use the atmosphere to do seismology. And uh, here the Earth will tell us something, some direction. So this our work done uh, mainly in the last 10 years uh, and done also uh, at GPL, uh, where we use the fact that uh, the seismic wave uh, send signal in the atmosphere and this signal in the atmosphere is uh, reaching the ionosphere. And therefore, because it is reaching the ionosphere, you can just detect the wave in the ionosphere. This is something which is known science many, many years. It started in the 60s. Uh, and uh, we use different ways to do that. You know, we sound the ionosphere with uh, GPS. We sound the ionosphere with Doppler. We sound the ionosphere with air glow. We sound the ionosphere with uh, over the horizon radar, which are early warning system. But at the end, you know, we get uh, the, the displacement of the ionosphere. And uh, I show you example. So these are example of uh, quake in Japan, magnitude eight, magnitude nine quake. And uh, the small dot are uh, the sounding of the ionosphere done by the GPS uh, station. So it is basically the integrated value of uh, the amount of electrons, the total electronic content, filtered in the bandwidth of the wave. And uh, what you will see, okay, just, you will just see the wave generated by the quake. Uh, here, you see, here again, you see all the time the pattern, you know, and this is for Tohoku, of course, very large wave. So this is uh, working very well, and uh, we have all the quake like that. Uh, in the ionosphere. So the first idea is why not to do the same on Venus. Now, the second point is even more interesting. So these waves, they will leave the Earth, you know, they will go on the top, so on the bottom. And at some time, you know, they will reach uh, the ionosphere where you have this air glow emission, the air glow emission is associated to the recombination of the oxygen with the electron. This is the red air glow at 630 nanometer. And to give you the order of magnitude, so I gave the order of magnitude of the, of the light emitted in Rayleigh, but uh, this is maybe better. So to give you the order of, of, or the order of magnitude, this light is uh, something like a, a, 12 milliwatt per kilometer square. So therefore you have uh, one kilometer square and you have 12 milliwatt of light generated by this. And what we want to detect, our wave is uh, something of the order of 100 microwatt per kilometer. So this is a typical order of magnitude. And uh, I show you again uh, the result here. This is a quake from, uh, this is a tsunami by the way. Uh, so uh, the tsunami generated by the Ida Gwai tsunami uh, from Canada arriving in Hawaii with an amplitude of the order of two centimeters. So this is a movie done by uh, Lucie Roland uh, with the uh, uh, TEC variation. And here you will have a movie uh, of air glow uh, done by the team of uh, Jonathan Makela from University of Illinois. Uh, and uh, what you will see, you will see this wave in this color, okay, this part, the, the black and white are the simulations, the color one are the real data, but this black and white are the real data. These are clouds, you know, the camera is looking to the sky, so therefore we have the clouds between us and the ionosphere. So don't take, a, okay, don't take so much attention to the clouds. 
So here you get the GPS observation and you see you know, this oscillation here associated to, to the tsunami wave very clearly here again. Uh, this is a two centimeter uh, tsunami, so a very small one. And uh, please take care of the time of the top. The tsunami will arrive at 8 hours 30. So clouds, 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 you know. The moon was there, so therefore we were looking to the air glow on the opposite side of the moon. And, uh, okay, 7.58. No, the tsunami arrived. Here you see the wave uh, of the tsunami, you know, coming just from the, the Canadian direction. So this is also another way to, to, to look for Venus if we can detect this. These are tsunamis, long period wave. The big issue will be to do that for seismic wave, much shorter period, which means larger telescope. But okay, this is the future. So I finish here, and uh, uh, this is a summary. We have a lot of data today uh, for both the Earth, the Moon, all data with very new science. Very soon, I hope we will be able to go to the interior of Mars with insight. Maybe in the 2020, 2025, we will be able to go to uh, the moon. I do think that uh, at the same time, we'll start to have the first space mission. At least we are working on a nanosat to do that uh, uh, from uh, space. And, uh, I finish with uh, Venus in order to do that. I don't really know what will be the best way to do it, to go on the ground or to use the atmosphere to get uh, the interior structure. Thank you.